chapter 9. Romans 9 is in the New Testament, which is the second half of your Bible. If you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Romans chapter 9. Um, I want to ask you what would seem on service to be a very simple, straightforward question, but can be quite complex to answer. I want you to consider it for just a moment. Do you trust God? I think I'm saying, do you trust God? Now, as believers, we, we, hopefully, if you're a Christian, you ought to be saying yes this morning. You do trust the Lord. But I want you to be careful in the way that you think about you trusting God. There are thousands of ways that on a daily circumstance that we often don't trust God. Uh, one of the ways that we don't trust God is that we worry. We worry about what's going to happen, what's going to take place, and so uh, we let worry it can consume our life. We don't believe. When we worry, we believe that God's going to withhold something for us. God's not going to take care of us. You know, that God's going to be with us today, but he may not be with us tomorrow. And so really when we worry, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust you. I don't trust what you're going to do in my life. I don't trust that you're going to be there for me. I don't trust you're going to provide for me. Or if it's not worry, we sort of have the, the opposite side of that. Maybe we complain. And we complain about what's happened in life. We complain about what's been given to us. Uh, we complain about uh, what's taken place. And so what we believe is, that God, you, you have done something to me that I don't deserve. God, you've given me something that I don't deserve. And God, I don't trust you. I don't trust your judgment. Because I don't trust your judgment, I'm complaining. And so in a lot of ways, when we worry and we complain, we don't trust that God is trustworthy. We don't, we don't trust God. Or maybe it's not worry and complaints that we wrestle with. Maybe it's guilt. Have you ever wrestled with guilt? You've done something and you felt guilty about it. And uh, perhaps you've gone to the Lord and you said, Lord, I'm sorry I did this. Uh, please forgive me. I want to repent of the sin. But you still struggle with the guilt that you have. And what you're doing is you're saying, God, I don't trust you. I don't trust that you've forgiven me. I don't trust when your word says that you're faithful and just to forgive me of all unrighteousness. I don't believe you. I don't trust you that you've actually forgiven me of this which is one of the reasons why we struggle with guilt over sins that we've already confessed to the Lord. Trust in the Lord is essential for all areas of life, particularly for our salvation. We, you have to believe and trust in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And if you don't trust in Jesus, then there is no salvation. And so it, it is essential that we trust the Lord and learn to trust Him so we don't wrestle with worry and complaint and worry with guilt and anxiety and these things that we, we wrestle with. So it brings us to a key question. Is God trustworthy? I mean, we say we trust Him, but is God trustworthy? Do we really trust the Lord? And so how do we develop a trustworthiness of the Lord? Well, one of the key ways we do that is we look at what He has done, we look at what He has promised, and we ask ourselves, is, is there ever a time that God has been unfaithful? Is there ever a time that God has not kept His promises? Has there ever been a time where God was untrustworthy? You see, if God has ever failed in any way, then he absolutely would be untrustworthy. But what we want to declare, what we want to understand is that God is trustworthy in all things because God has never failed. God has never broken his promise. God has always kept his word. Well, a big question about that very issue comes about in Romans chapter 9. You see, in Romans chapter 9, it deals with the very essence of the entire Old Testament. I mean, essentially two-thirds of our Bible. You look at the, old, the whole Old Testament, and the question arises is, did God keep his promises in the Old Testament? This has arisen because in Romans chapter 8, Paul has made these wonderful promises about how there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that God once saves you, keeps you, and maintains you, and there's nothing you can do that will take you out of the hand of God. So the question arises, well, if that is true, then did God fail with Israel? As you read the Old Testament, God made all these promises to the, Old Te to the Israelite people. Did God fail? Did God break his promises in the Old Testament? Because we look and we say, you know, most of the Israelites, they don't believe in Jesus. The, the gospel has largely gone to the Gentiles. So Paul, did God fail with the Israelites? And we told you that sort of the key divining verse for this whole section is, is Romans chapter 9, verse 6, that question about whether or not God failed. Paul has been walking us through about uh, the way that God has not failed, that God has always saved the true Israel. And um, God is free to do so 
Because by definition, mercy is undeserved. That's what we looked at last week, if you weren't here with us last Sunday, that mercy is, is something that God freely gives. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that we deserve. By definition, mercy has to be given freely. And as a result of that, not all will be saved. However, God will save as he deems and gives mercy. So the question arises from that, coming out of what we looked at last week. Well, if that's the case, if not all will be saved, if some are given mercy and some harden their hearts, is man still responsible? In other words, how can God hold us accountable if that's the case? If mercy is freely given from God's perspective, then how is it that man is responsible? How is it that God could look at us and go, you're responsible for your sins if that's the case? Well, this is the very questions that he answers in the latter half of Romans chapter 9. Read with me, Romans 9, beginning in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? That question of how how can God hold us, how can God hold us responsible? How can he hold us uh, at fault if this is the case? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to, the, to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And we'll stop right back there and pick up with his uh, quote in Hosea and Isaiah in just a minute. (coughs) But he's making the point that God has been faithful to his promises by freely glorifying himself. And God does this. God freely acts and wills to make his glory known. The the million dollar question is there in verse 19. Verse 19. How is it that God still finds fault with us? Now, that attitude carries with it no sense of sin. It's as as though looking, you know, the the very question that's being asked in verse 19 is a declaration of saying, you know, how can God look at me and find fault uh, for nothing that I did? I'm not responsible for anything that I have done is a question that has been asked in verse 19. It places ourselves in a position of judgment to be able to judge the Lord. What it assumes, it is assumes that we have the moral standing to make God give us an account. In other words, it assumes that we judge God in verse 19. So it's the ability to be able to look at God and say, God, all right, well, God, you have freely acted. You have freely given grace, but you haven't given grace to, or you haven't given mercy to everyone, and you're free to give mercy to whoever you want to. But does that make you arbitrary? Does that make you uh, pick this one and not this one? And it assumes that you and I have the moral standard to look at God and say, God, you've done wrong. God, you, you, the way that you have distributed mercy, the way that you freely give mercy is wrong in this understanding. This is why we are confronted in verse 20. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? There's a great chasm between man and God. You and I are finite, limited creatures. And not only are we finite and limited, but you and I are not innocent. We are sinners in rebellion against God apart from Jesus Christ. In other words, God is not answerable to man, but man is answerable to God. When he asks, who are you to answer back to God? It's this idea that we hurl our opinion in face of an authority. Now, we understand this on sort of a very basic level. Anybody who's ever had children or grandchildren, I promise you, at some point in your life, you will look at them and say, don't talk back to me, right? I mean, we've gone through this with all four of our kids. Our youngest is four right now, and she will straight up look at us after we tell her to do something, and she's like, nah, that's not how that works. Don't act like your kids aren't demons too. We all know them, all right? But she will. She'll straight up and be like, no. And there's something inside of me that wants to go, who are you, oh child, to answer back to me? You're four. 
And this is sort of the, the phrase that's going on, on here is verse 19 says, God, how is that fair? We're standing in moral judgment of God. And verse 20 says, but who are you? What moral standing do you have? What authority do you have? What opinion do you have to be able as a finite human being to look to God and go, God, no, no, that's, that's not how that works. Let me tell you how that's going to work. Job experiences this in Job chapter 40. Job goes through all the tragedy that he goes through, and he's looking for God, and he's, he's wanting to know where God is, and God finally says, brace yourself like a man. By the way, if God ever tells you to brace yourself like a man, that's not a good thing. And so as Job 40, he's like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I told the oceans you should go this far and no further? God is reminding him, hey, Job, you're Job. I'm God. Let me do, do my thing. You be a man. Let me be God. The same question is being asked here in verse 20. Who are you? Where is your moral standing to answer back to God? I mean, you think about it this way. All of our faculties of wisdom, and we we have wisdom. Some of us have more wisdom than others, but we have wisdom. And all of our faculties of wisdom and rational thought are derived from God himself. I mean, God, being a rational being, has made us rational beings and has given us the ability to have ration and uh, to, to be able to have reason and be able to have logic and be able to have wisdom. But all of that is derived from him. Who are we to look back upon the one who gave us that variability and say, God, it doesn't work that way. God, you don't know what you're doing. To make the point, he uses an image of clay. It reminds us of a tradition in the Old Testament in order to help us think correctly about God. The tradition comes from both Isaiah and Jeremiah. It's Isaiah chapter 29. It's in Jeremiah chapter 18. You're probably very familiar with Jeremiah 18 where God tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and he's going to instruct him there. We have a lot of artwork that usually deals with the potter's house that's been sold over the years. So he uses this idea in verse 20. Well, what is molded? Say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? Remember, he's drawing from Jeremiah 18, Isaiah chapter 29. The image here is molded, not created. Now, that's an important distinction. Read it carefully. He's not making the point about creation. He's making the point about being molded. Matter of fact, the very word that's used there, molded, is the word plasma. It's where we get the word plastic from. I don't know if you've ever seen anything plastic made, but you take hot plastic, you put it into a mold, and it hardens into the shape of whatever, whatever it is. What makes plastic so great, you can make it into just about any type of shape that you want to make it. Same idea that's given here. Say, so look, the, the molder, the potter, the one that has come, has shaped out of the same lump of clay some things for honorable use and some things for dishonorable use. It's the image of like a large house. You go to a large house, you're going to see different objects. So if you come into my house, you're going to see different things. You're going to walk in. Uh, most people come in through our back door. When they come in through our back door, we have our kitchen. And the dining room is called kind of one big open area there. And next to our table, we have a china cabinet. And in the china cabinet, we have china, I guess. That's what it's called. We've got things. Um, uh, we don't have a lot because it was broken when we moved here. But what we have left is there. And so you're supposed to walk into our, our, our living room and you're supposed to look at that and go, ooh, ah, that's pretty. These are honorable things in our house. Then we have other places in our house that if you come over to our house unannounced, we see you in the driveway. And because we have four kids, we say, kids, grab everything, throw it in the closet. And so we throw everything in the closet, hopefully before you get into the door. Those things are for dishonorable use. Matter of fact, if you look under our sink, you open up our sink, and there's, we have our little Walmart bags and things that we keep for the extra garbage bags around the house and those things. We hide all those things in our house. So you come over to our house, we have things that you're meant to see that you go, ooh, ah, that's pretty. We have other things that you're not meant to see that are dishonorable, but things that we use on a daily basis. This is the image that he's giving us in verse 20 and 21, that the potter, the master, has taken from the same lump of clay and he's molded them for different reasons and different purposes according to his good pleasure. Some honorable, some dishonorable. Again, the focus is not on creation. And the reason I make that point is this reason. The Bible is very clear that you and I are created in the image of God. No matter who you are, we're created in the image of God. And because we're created in the image of God, we're given certain honor and value and worth. So the focus here is not on creation. In other words, God did not create us to make us sin 
In other words, God did not create us for the purpose of damning us to hell. The question is, what does God do with the lump of clay that is here? What, how does he mold what is already here? The point that he's making is, what does God do with fallen humanity? The clay itself is not neutral. The clay itself is sinful. The clay is humanity that has rebelled against God. What is God going to do with that? And so if God were to split that lump of clay and put some over here and some over here, he were to give mercy over here but not mercy over here, who, and you, who are you and I to complain? And think about it this way. If God were to condemn the whole lump of fallen clay you and I would be given exactly what we deserve. Exactly what we deserve. In our sin, we deserve to be condemned. We deserve to be punished for our sin. But if God freely gives mercy to the lump of clay, who are we to claim, of course God gave me mercy. I earned it. By definition, mercy is unearned. By definition, mercy is a free gift given by God. So what the point that he's making is, look, God is free to do as he wills. He, as our creator, as a sovereign, as a judge, he is free to do what he, as he wills. But as he wills is not arbitrary. He, it's, it's wise. And God does it in all of his wisdom. And we don't know why God does the things he does. We don't always know how God does the things he does. But what we do know for sure is that you and I are in sin. Not only do we know that we're in sin, we confirm it every time we sin. And when we sin, we choose it deliberatively. No one's ever forced me to sin. Every time I've sinned, I chose it freely. And so I know that because I choose sin, when God shows me mercy, He shows me mercy because He's a good and gracious and merciful God. And He does it not because I deserve it. He does it because He's freely chosen to express mercy towards me. This is the clue that he's giving us here in this passage. So he lays out for us a conditional clause in verse 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now this is a conditional clause. And the key point in verse 22 is this. What if God, choosing to show, in in other words, what if God, desiring to show this to creation, has acted in this way. We often said, say this, that the chief end of man is to glorify God. And the purpose for your life, the reason God created you, the reason God made you, the reason why you exist, the reason why you're breathing air today is to glorify God, your creator. That's the whole purpose of your life. But what is the chief end of God? If the chief end of man is to glorify God, then what is the chief end of God? Well, the chief end of God is to do the exact same thing, to glorify himself. He is the highest good, worthy of being glorified and worthy to be honored. So if the chief end of man is to glorify God and the chief end of God is to glorify God, then this is exactly what he does. Well, how does he do that? How does he show his wrath to make his power known? Well, we get a little bit of a clue in this conditional clause. What if God has endured with much patience Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now the question would come about, who or whom has prepared the vessels of wrath for destruction? Now there are some people that would go what they would call a double predestination route and say that God has done this. I do not think that this is what the text is saying or talking about because the emphasis is not on creation. The emphasis is on what God does with the mold. When it makes a point, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, it, leaves, it doesn't say, and it, he could quite say this clearly, he could say, God created them for this reason. That's not what he says. What ends up happening is we prepare ourselves for destruction. And the reason why we do that is we allow our sins to accumulate over time and we confirm in ourselves our own sins. We confirm in ourselves that we don't want God and we separate ourselves from Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we are preparing ourselves for the wrath that is to come. One of the other reasons I make this point is from the passage that we read earlier in the service. You remember earlier in the service I read to you from 2 Peter chapter 3? What you may not realize is that in 2 Peter chapter 3, Right after those verses, in 8 and 9, 
Peter says this, and I'm so glad he says this because it makes me feel better preaching this passage today. 2 Peter chapter 3 says this in verse 15. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Now he's making the same point about patience that Paul makes in Romans chapter 9. He says, look, the Lord is the, to, to the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is slow towards us in his judgment, not as we would count slowness, so that, but that we might lead to repentance because he does not desire for any of us to perish. He says this just a few verses later. Count that patience as salvation. Why? Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them in these matters. These are, these are some of the things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist in their own destruction. Thank you, Peter. Peter just said, hey, Paul's written to you about the patience of God. I know they're hard to understand. Whew. Maybe you don't realize what I'm saying here. This is a hard passage. It's a hard passage to preach in Romans chapter 9. And Peter Peter, the apostle Peter, has just said, yeah, it's okay that you're having a hard time to understand them because they are hard to understand. Peter makes this point about the patience of God, that God has been patient with us in order to give us an opportunity to repent. I mean, look, look what he says, verse 20, Romans 9, verse 22. What if God has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order, verse 23, to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. So Peter's making this point, looking back at Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3 and saying, look, God has been patient with you, giving you the opportunity to repent. This is why we give the free offer of the gospel. We offer the gospel to anyone and everyone. We, we agree with 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says that God does not desire for anyone to perish. And so we look at people and we say, look, God is patient with you in order to give you opportunity to repent. In order for you to trust in Jesus, God is patient. God's patience oper- opens opportunities for mercy but God's patience does not last forever there's coming a day where God's patience does wear out and when God's patience wear out there is wrath and judgment and when wrath and judgment comes man is without excuse because we're without excuse God is just in how he uses the clay And if God has been merciful to this group of people through Jesus Christ who believe and trust in him and through patience have found repentance and trusted in Jesus, then we praise God that God has been merciful. But if God takes this lump of clay and has not extended his mercy to everyone because they've not trusted in Jesus, they've rebelled against Jesus, there's been no repentance in Jesus, they've not trusted in him, and God expresses his wrath towards him, It doesn't mean that God is not merciful or God is not gracious or God is not loving. Matter of fact, quite the opposite. God will be glorified in this as he displays his power and his justice and his holiness in those who reject Jesus Christ. This is the point he's making. uh, That there's some vessels that will be made known through his wrath. Some will be made known through his mercy. And if the chief end is to glorify himself, then God will be glorified in all things. So we believe this, that not all people will be saved. You realize that, right? Not everyone will be saved. Maybe let me put it another way. Jesus put it like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In other words, there is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. And if you're not in Jesus, then you won't be saved. And unfortunately, there are people who are not in Jesus. And so if you're in Jesus, you know God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. You know of Him and you will glorify Him through Jesus Christ. But if you're not in Jesus, you will still glorify God. You see, we will all glorify God one day, either actively in Jesus or passively in rebellion against Jesus as our knee bows and our tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We will all glorify God either in heaven because we know Jesus and we glorify Jesus and we worship Jesus with God in heaven or we will glorify God in hell as we give testimony to the righteous judgment of God in our sins. There is no in-between. 
So Paul is making this point. Look, God has freely acts and wills for His glory to make Himself known. And if some people are saved because they know Jesus and some people are lost because they don't know Jesus, then that's God's right to do so. And it brings us back to the question, well, what about Israel? What about God keeping His promise and being trustworthy? Why haven't a large portion of them believed up until this point? Why is it that the Gentiles are coming to faith? This is the whole point He's making. Look, all these Gentiles have come into this lump of clay, and all these Israelites have stayed out of that lump of clay. What is God doing here? Well, God has fulfilled His promise to rescue many Gentiles and a remnant of Israel. This is why He quotes Hosea and Isaiah at the end of the chapter. Look what he says in verse 25. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who is not my beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Now to understand his reference, you have to understand a little bit about Hosea. In the Old Testament book of Hosea, God tells Hosea to go marry an unfaithful wife. He does. He marries Gomer. It was meant to be an entire illustration of the people of Israel. The people of Israel had been unfaithful to God. And as Gomer had been unfaithful to Hosea, they had been unfaithful to God. And so they had children. And they named them lovely names. Like, not loved. And not my people. And no mercy. Um, By the way, if any of you are getting ready to have children, do not name them that. Um, but he named them, named them, not love, not my people, no mercy. Hosea's wife goes off, commits adultery, ends up being sold. Hosea goes and redeems her. And when he redeems her, his children are renamed from not my people to my people, from not love to love, from no mercy to mercy or showing mercy towards them. And God says, look at Hosea and Gomer. This is an object lesson of what I'm going to do. I'm going to redeem my people, and I'm going to take those people that are not my people, and I'm going to make them my people. And I'm going to take those people that are not loved, and I'm going to love them. And I'm going to take those people that have no mercy, and I'm going to extend mercy to them. Paul quotes that here in Hosea, in Romans chapter 9, quotes that part in Hosea to make this point, that it has always been God's plan to save those that are not His people to love those who are not loved, to extend mercy to those who haven't mercy extended to them. He's making this point that, look, this this has always been God's plan, and this is what God is doing in saving the Gentiles. He's calling us into the people of God. We were not the people of God. Israel was the people of God. God is bringing us in and making us the people of God through Jesus Christ. God has loved us through Jesus Christ. God has given us mercy through Jesus Christ. God has always always bless those that don't deserve it. And Hosea becomes a template for how God is going to redeem and save the Gentiles. Well, what about Israel? Well, this is why he quotes Isaiah. Isaiah, verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not let us uh, left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. He's quoting Isaiah to talk about when the, you look at the Old Testament, Isaiah said, look, there's going to come a time where the people of God rebel against God to the point where it seems like there's nobody left. There's no one that's going to, to, to follow the Lord. Paul is quoting this to make the point that God has, has never promised to save all of Israel, but he has promised to save Some of them, a remnant, those who still follow him and trust him and pursue him. We see a great example of this at Elijah, in the story of Elijah. You remember the story of Elijah? Elijah goes up against the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And so, you know, he called down fire from heaven, called down fire from heaven, and God sends down fire from heaven and shows that he's the one true God. And what does Elijah do? He runs off and he pouts. He goes and finds a cave and he pouts. I love that story because God comes to him and says, Here's some cake. Take a nap. I'm like, even the Lord gives the advice of eating cake and taking naps. It's good, good advice. When he wakes up, God comes to him, and Elijah starts pouting more. I'm the only one left. No one follows you. No one's obedient to you. No one, no one cares about you. 
And God tells him in 1 Kings, he says, I've reserved 4,000 who have not bent the knee to Baal. He makes a point to Elijah. He says, look, Elijah, you think you're the only one left, but I've saved a remnant. I've, I've kept a group of people who will be faithful to me, and I've watched over them. And there are, there are 4,000 others who, who don't bow down to Baal. You're not the only one left. Even throughout the Old Testament, this idea of a remnant carries throughout that God is not going to save all of them, but there'll be a group of people who do trust in him, and God will save them. It comes back to that fundamental question. Did God fail? Romans 9, 6. Did God fail? Jesus has come. The Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament has come. He's died on the cross. He's paid for our sins. And it appears as though the very people that he was promised to have by and large rejected rejected him. Paul says, no, God has not failed. God is doing what God has always done. God has been faithful to his promises by freely glorifying himself. And he's freely glorifying himself by bringing Gentiles in through Jesus Christ. And and oh yeah, it looks like all of Israel has rejected him, but not all of Israel has rejected him. There is a remnant that follows him and believes in him as their Messiah. You want proof of that? We have a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, who's writing this book about Jesus. His name is Paul. He said, look, there's a group of us who still follow Jesus and who are faithful to him. Now, this is good news for you and I, because it means that God has always been faithful to his promises. There's never a promise that he's, he has broken. Matter of fact, Paul is going to say later in the book of Corinthians that all of God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. So we come back as believers, and we look at believers as believers in Jesus Christ, and we say, you know, I don't always understand. I don't understand why this person has has believed and why this person has rejected. I'm praying for this person. I hope they come to Jesus, but I don't understand. But here's what I know. Where people are unfaithful, God has always been faithful. And there has never been a promise that God has broken. So I bring you back to my original question. Do you trust God? And if you trust Him, then you can trust Him to be merciful. You can trust Him to be wise. You can trust Him to be good. You can trust Him not to worry about what tomorrow will bring. You can trust Him not to complain about anything He's given you. You can trust him that when you confess your sins and ask, ask him to forgive you, that he actually forgives you. And you don't have to wrestle with guilt. Dear believer, there has never been a promise God has broken. When we look at Romans 9, Romans 9 puts the entire Old Testament on trial. Was God faithful to all of these things from Genesis to Malachi? Now Paul's argument is this. He has always been faithful to every promise to his people. When you wrestle with whether or not God can be trusted, we come back to this one simple conclusion. God is trustworthy in all things. He's trustworthy with the clay He's trustworthy with his grace. He's trustworthy with his mercy. He's trustworthy with tomorrow. He's trustworthy with every anxiety, every worry, every complaint. You can trust God. If you're an unbeliever, I want to finish by saying this. It's a great picture in Romans 9. God has a lump of clay And you and I are in no position to argue with why this lump of clay has mercy and this lump of clay doesn't. But we know why. When you take the gospel into account, it comes down to this one simple fact. This lump of clay knows Jesus. And this lump of clay does not. You see, God is merciful, and he extends his mercy to everyone who is in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus, you have God's mercy. If you don't know Jesus, you do not have God's mercy. 
what I want to encourage you as we come now to the time of invitation is I want to encourage you to trust the God who is trustworthy. That means trusting him that his son has paid for your sins. It's not about your good deeds. It's not about what church you belong to. It's not about where you go. It's about what Jesus has done. Is God trustworthy when he says that he will forgive you of your sins when you repent and trust in Jesus? And if he is, the difference between this lump of clay and this lump of clay is Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look at it this morning. We agree with Peter. (laughs) Paul has written some hard things. But we trust that you are free to give mercy to whoever you will give mercy to. We also trust that that mercy comes by Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as believers in Jesus, we will trust you in all things. We will realize there's never been a promise you've ever broken. You will never start breaking promises now. May you teach us to trust you in all things. Father, is anyone here that doesn't know you, may they realize that this lump of fallen clay, the only difference between them is those who know Jesus and those who don't. May may this be the day that we repent and trust in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, I want to invite you to respond to the message you just heard.